Hello, hello, Randy Patrick here. Welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Got some interesting things to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to focus on some more conceptual things as opposed to property values around the country. Uh, we all know that they've plateaued leveling off and are starting to degree, decrease now, and we'll get to those probably later in the week. But I want to talk to, to you guys about something first with respect to financing. And an article came out in the Wall Street Journal the other day with regards to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, they're backing more mortgages of those people who are deeper in debt. And interestingly enough, uh, almost 30% uh, of loans that mortgage uh, giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, I guess originated last year, are to people who have greater than 43% uh, debt to income ratio. So the housing debt is going to be greater than 43%. So basically that share, and here's, here's the real issue, is that the share of people that they're lending to regarding uh, mortgages that have over 43% DTI um, have basically doubled since 2015. So roughly 30% of all the loans they originate are for higher DTI people. And really, um, it's one of those things where it, it, it creates a lot of debate and questions with respect to the government's role in housing. And, you know, basically people are saying, you know, cheap, federally funded um, credit is available to millions of borrowers and, you know, allowing people to buy properties. All that's really doing is accelerating and fueling home price increase because they're raising the, your ability to get a loan uh, which you know causes more competition which you know you, maybe you shouldn't be buying something at, at that value and uh, with respect to the low inventory uh, in certain market segments just it just fuels you know unnatural price growth and it exposes more people and Fannie and Freddie to more risky loans or and risky people so um, basically that's kind of the, the scene here it's a Wall Street Journal um, I guess you could say report that I will put on as put the link up, but it's interesting because they've loaded up on loans with de with debt to income ratios about 43%, and the Urban Institute uh, estimated that uh, an additional 3.3 million mortgages were originated between 2014 and 2018 because of this little what they call a patch. So you know this is above and beyond the qualified mortgage sort of you know zone here. So this is above and beyond that, which is very interesting. And the fact of the matter is, um, you know, with with the huge amount of housing shortage in the affordable housing area. Um, you can't address shortage by driving up housing prices through leverage, and that's what we've been doing. So, you know, we talked about this before that, you know, if you take a look at, you know, where we've where we've come since the housing bubble peak of 2006, going down, you know, the trough roughly. If you take a look at some of the Case Shiller um, graphs, you know, we were at the peak in 2006. We lost all about 30%, you know, to the trough. We've gained that, and we're about 11% above the 2006 peak. So a lot of that, you know, a lot of the gain is is actually being, you know, we'll say, uh, I wouldn't say the word blame, but it's being heralded on. I guess you could say uh, great, you know, job opportunities, you know, growth, you know, ec economy doing well the whole bit. Where when you take a look at some of this, it really hasn't been that way. We've talked about how the, um, you know, the the shadow inventory and how the lenders have held back properties from hitting the market, thus kind of choking the supply. And now when you have the federal government actually, you know, allowing higher and higher, you know, 43%, above 43%, 45%, 50% DTI ratios, all that's doing is allowing people to to increase what they can afford via a loan product. So again, higher debt to income, low down payment, you can buy more property or higher property, you're getting to a higher segment, and, I, and that's really why we've grown. So there's been a lot of things that have fueled this growth. I don't think it's been the natural things of the housing market that has that have fueled where we are today. So that's, that's you have to say that. So interesting enough, but again, uh, certainly there's a chart here. I know you can't really see it, but when you look at the at the bar graph, you know, you can, it's almost double what it was four years ago. And all indications are that they're gonna keep moving at that pace until something changes. Very interesting. So having said that, which I think is interesting, I wanna talk about the iBuyer. So iBuyers are really the, you know, people you can go to and talk to you know online. You could submit offers. They can give you offer prices, etc. I buyers are groups like you know um, Open Door, even the Zillow buying program, things like that. Offer Pad. So those are the I buyers, and the I buyers to me are what I would call a market disruptor because they're coming into certain segments of the housing market, and you know they're essentially you know offering uh, a value, you know a quick and easy close, uh, maybe some 
reduce prices and closing costs depends on how they're set up but again they're, what they're really doing is they're taking away you know the marketing the middleman the real estate agent commission the fact that maybe you need to you know do extra things to the home uh, to give it more curb appeals things like that so the eye buyers are certainly uh, I would call a market disruptor in the field but what I've learned though and, and it makes sense too is the fact that you know they are growing uh, but they're it's very interesting so the eye buyers are growing but they're growing their footprint in the south which is traditionally more uh, cost effective cheaper property so they're not buying in the high 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 areas they're buying more in the south all right you've got things like open door offer pad you've got redfin now you've got uh, zillow has their instant offers and a lot of these groups use phoenix arizona as the starting point to i guess try out their markets and they've expanded but they've expanded primarily in the southern states the warmer climates etc uh, and there's i'll have a link up to this there's a really neat um We'll call it a um, info infographic that they have, and when you look at um, how they sort of hit their marketplace, and this is what is very very interesting, is the fact that they've they've hit markets that are in growth mode. So obviously, you know, the whole idea of if they're going to buy and they're going to sell, it's got to work in an appreciating markets. So they're they're playing in a lower price on average market, so to speak, um, or they're picking out the right properties, and they're also offering well, they're they're trying to buy and sell, so it's got to be an appreciating market. So Time will, will tell to see if that has problems because our appreciation has really slowed down quite a bit now and some locations we've actually declined in value. So, but again, you know, when you take a look at some of the, um, you know, where they're located, you know, the, the average, you know, increase over the five year period is about 50%. That's really interesting. Um, in many of the markets where I buyers are present, we are seeing home prices reach their peaks in 2018. And um, uh, for, you know, price of homes have increased 62% um in five years and reach their peak in 2018 so these areas which you'll see on the infographic uh shows you know some locations that have gained a lot of equity so of course clearly any i buyer is going to go into that marketplace and and want to buy and sell just because it makes sense because they're riding you know the appreciation and equity wave here so again i call it a market disruptor the reason being uh phases out real estate agents uh, also can possibly hurt uh, you know, real estate investors like wholesalers or people who do fix and flip because again, you know, I don't want to, you know, as a homeowner, do I need to deal with somebody? Do I expect a lower offer, aggressive offer? Hey, you know, these, these I buyers are typically funded and they've got lots of cash to spend so they can go and make offers via the internet and uh, connect in that capacity. And, you know, a lot of it is just quick and clean less mess, less messing with people, less haggle negotiations. And my assumption is a lot of these I buyers are probably going to pay more than a wholesaler will pay, knowing the fact that if the property and market's appreciating, that they're going to make some stuff on the back end. That's where they're going to make their money. So just interesting though, that if you take a look at the map here, it's primarily, you know, go cut the, the country in half and go down. That's where the I buyers are playing. So <clears throat> let's look at it. So Open Door, for example, is in Phoenix and Tucson, Sacramento, Riverside, LA, Denver, Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, uh, Atlanta, Vegas, Charlotte, Raleigh, uh, Portland, Minneapolis, Nashville, Austin, Dallas, Houston, San Antonio. That's Open Door. And you'll find a lot of these are similar too. So um, let's take a look here. Offer Pad is in Phoenix and Tucson, LA, Orlando, Tampa, Las Vegas, Atlanta, uh, Charlotte and Raleigh, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, San Antonio, and Salt Lake City in Utah. So Zillow Instant Offers, Phoenix, Riverside, Denver, Atlanta, Las Vegas, Charlotte, Raleigh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston. I know that Zillow wants to expand. Redfin Now, you're gonna see Redfin Now in San Diego, LA, Inland Empire of California, Denver, and Dallas, Fort Worth area. So interesting enough that a lot of these um, I guess you so the I buyers do have plans. They've raised more money and they do have plans to go into more locations as time goes on, but primarily in the south. And you know, when you t again, you look at that infographic, it's, it's almost like a direct line, you know, and it's probably because, again, a little cheaper home prices, uh, seasonality, uh, maybe a little better to, to work in a non, you know, winter market. Who knows? As far as I'm concerned, I mean, that does affect some of the sales in some of the northern states, et cetera. So it's interesting enough that in a lot of the areas of California, too, so not, not everybody's playing in the higher price markets as well. So again, something to think about. But again, you know, we're changing. So, you know, 10 years ago, 
though we didn't have this opportunity, we didn't have hedge funds coming after us, we didn't have I buyers disrupting the market. So if you want to play in the real estate industry, there's a lot going on right now. It's a lot to keep track of, but you can see there's a lot more competition. More investors, more real estate agents are out there now, more applications, more I buyers, more investor buyers, more institutional buyers. I mean, it's, it's happening uh, right now. And plus normal retail buyers too. That's, that's increasing, they can't find homes. So lots going on here. Everyone wants to make their money in real estate, which is interesting because it leads us right into the fact that Zillow lost, <coughs> excuse me, lost $109,000 per flip. So in their flipping, their fledgling eye flipping business, uh, buying and selling houses, they lost $109,000 per flip. Their net losses tripled, but their stock prices soared, which I think is very interesting. So it, it, Zillow had a quarterly earnings report on Thursday, and essentially the Zillow offers, which buys and sells homes, a new hassle-free way to buy and sell homes directly through, through Zillow. And you know when it, when it came down to it, it, you know just some very very basic numbers here. Uh, you know, they sold 414 homes. Sales proceeds added 128 million for an average selling price of 310 per home. Uh, the purchase of these homes, uh, I guess it was a cost of sales was 295,000 per home. So they basically made a, a gross margin of $14,700 or 4.9% per flip. So, you know, just under 5% gross margin not a really effective home flipping business. But again, uh, that's just on the gross margin. So when you factor in the cost of homes, so the cost of money to buy homes, get them ready to flip, market them, finance them until they're sold, deal with the transactions, it booked a lot of expenses. And that's the interesting thing about it too. So when you look at the numbers, um, they actually lost, when you had the expenses in, lost $45.2 million on 414 flips. So really, Zillow lost $109,000 per flip on average. That's 37% on each flip on average. So ultimately, that is not a good flipping business. It's a, it's a horrible business. And But however, I guess the way stock prices and the uh, industry looks at them is that you know um, it, it's adding revenue. It added $120 million to revenues. And basically, um, you know, it, its losses soared by 263%, uh, but you know, its stock prices were up. So, so how do you figure that out? So it's not really an interesting way of looking at things. You figure if the company loses money, which they've been prone to for a number of years now, losing money, losing money, um, why are stock prices going up? Well, I guess they've got an idea and people seem to want to participate in that idea. But when you, again, when you look at this uh, in particular, not a good home flipping business. Now, clearly, there's probably going to be in here some startup costs and some, you know, things that they would have done, you know, to hit the market sort of first time through. And, um, you know, that's obviously, you know, a cost of doing business and that you would, you would think that some of their expenses would be better as time goes on, they get more, more efficient. But, you know, starting off to me, the starting point is, is weak when, you know, your, your gross margin is 4.9%. So that's nothing. If you think about it, that's hardly any margin whatsoever. And then you add it, factor in all your costs, et cetera, of your operation, you know, they, they're losing big time here. So um, how this works for them in the future, I don't know. And um, I don't know what the other, I guess the iBuyer finances are. This is uh, Zillow came out because, you know, obviously they had uh, an earnings call, I guess their, their quarter report, first quarter report. But looking at this, I think is very interesting. And, you know, this only can work. I mean, if you think about it, they, they bought property at, you know, uh, was purchased at uh, 295 7 per home, sold for 310 per home. So, okay, they were able to buy and sell, but you know, you would think that those margins would be bigger. So, there's two things that are going on here is that they didn't buy it uh, at a good enough price, they didn't negotiate it better uh, and deal with the homeowners, and, and who knows what their formula is for that, and, and or their expectations of sales price have been reduced for whatever reasons because of, again, buyer fatigue, buyer frustration, social media out there, people not wanting to, to engage until, say, they see more material um, discounts on, on property. Because again, so there's no discounting these as a buy and sell. And so there's obviously a markup here. And, and we don't know, you know how much an, a pro, a, an average property was improved, if anything. Like, we just don't know that information at this point in time. But the point, point I'm making though is that not a, like, first time through looking at this, you know, I, I think any any home flipping business would go. Those are horrible gross margins, and obviously, you know, we have a lot of cost profile 
uh, in this business segment of Zillow. So we'll see what happens in the future. But again, I thought that was quite interesting. So let's see if the market, you know, again, a, de a depreciating market will affect this big time. And a lot of these I buyers, you know, have raised capital are deploying capital in, in various markets and going out trying to find property. So we'll see how the next few months, you know, fares for these I buyers. So very, very interesting. Maybe a sign of the times. All right, something here just to end off with. Um, so rising rents for millennials give a give rise to a new breed of lender. So a very, very quick article, article here. So there's several startups that are offering loans to recent college graduates, professionals moving to a new city, others who want to build credit or could use assistance making rent payments. So the whole thought is that, hey, you know, you get a new job, you're not quite solid on your money yet, or your, your whatever your income is, it's not a consistent thing. You're you're making commissions, or you're getting paid when you have jobs. So clearly, it's hard for people to uh, secure a property to rent and then maintain a good rent history. So there are companies now, almost like you could say them, call them cash advance type companies, who are offering um, money for you know this segment of borrower so they can pay their rent, which I think is really kind of interesting. So uh, it's for people who have irregular paychecks and, and they can't really make those you know, timely monthly payments. So, um, though, which, so again, another way to monetize an opportunity, you know, the issue would be, um, I suppose, you know, you, know there's, you can't secure that rent, that, that loan on the property because the renter does not own the property. So there's more risk there. So it's more of a credit-based uh, facility. Um, and this, the scary part would be, does this give renters the ability to overextend themselves and maybe uh, you know go for properties with, with higher rent or more features than they otherwise couldn't get without this cash advance? So I just found that was interesting. It just again it shows that innovations out there, folks. I mean, people are certainly thinking of ways how they can get their slice of the market, how they can participate. And you know when we just spoke about, um, I guess you could say Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, you know offering you know, more low down payment loans to a greater segment of the population, higher debt to income ratios, et cetera. Um, this sort of falls right in line, which I find interesting. So, you know, not only is the government doing that on the purchase side, now we've got entities who are saying, okay, we, I mean, there's a need clearly, uh, let's see how we can, you know, capitalize on that, which I think is, is, is wild. And they just, and they're, I guess who said this here was the um, company, I forget who the company is, but they did, did some, um, I guess you could say surveys and found that, you know, um, a few more landlords would consider taking credit card payment for rent as well too. I'm like, my assumption is, you know, if you're a landlord, you want cash or check because that's easiest for you. Not many people go out and establish their own merchant account where they can, you know, take a credit card because there's merchant fees and clearing fees and stuff like that. So I just find this kind of cool because, you know, if you, you know, there's a small percentage of people, 3% um, of those surveyed paid their landlord with credit cards and 16% said they would certainly pay with a credit card if the landlords agreed to that. So renters themselves know that, hey, if I can put one of my, you know, a month's rent on my credit card, I'm deferring that payment as well too, which, you know, if landlords are smart, they may want to do that, raise the rent a little bit, take credit card payments and offset your, you know, credit card merchant account charges. And um, now you're allowing renters to go deeper and deeper into rental debt as opposed to uh, mortgage debt as well too. So it looks like uh, from the debt perspective, um, they're trying to get us every which way as possible. So again, interesting, but uh, like two things to see where this is going. Uh, Cause once, you know, I think the last video I spoke of the fact of the one previous that US Census released the fact that uh, we hit an all time high with average rent across the country. So clearly it's gonna be harder for more people to maintain good rental history and payment history. So the advent of credit facilities to help you, you know, pay the rent or, you know, pay it and then you pay the credit facility back a couple of weeks later and they're popping up. It's again, I think it's very interesting uh, innovation at its best, but yet another market where we could see a lot of problems. Uh, you know, imagine having to, uh, you know, credit cards like, you know, are you going, is the landlord going to evict or they're going to keep hitting a credit card and the credit card is going to stop payment and then eventually the landlord will catch up to the, um, to the home, to the renter a couple of months later, who knows? So, but, but again, something to think about for the future. Or anyway, guys, so once again, um, if you like what you hear, help my channel grow, please subscribe. Uh, looking forward to uh, your, your comments and your likes and shares. And again, uh, I know I, I do owe some people some communication with respect to uh, communicating with me uh, on some property deals. So I will get back to you guys this week. Uh, but having said that, uh, have a good week. A lot of stuff happening in real estate. We'll get back to some more, uh, I guess we'll say property value stuff towards the end of the week. But I just thought that today was interesting to see where 
where the finance world uh, is, is taking a hit or seeing changes um, in our housing bubble environment. So everyone have a good week. I look forward to speaking with you soon.